international project, project dedicated to migration and civic engagement in our alliance. Uh, as you probably know, uh, the Open Labs, which are the main uh, tool of this work package, were born with a very local perspective. Uh, but at some point in our working group, we decided that uh, this was uh, perhaps not enough and we should take advantage of the network that we were building, the uh, eight Open Labs uh, running in the different institutions uh, allowed us to uh, pursue more uh, ambitious challenges and that's how the the project uh, was born uh, the idea was to develop a new model of transnational collaboration inside the alliance to face common challenges strongly and rooted in the civic identity of our alliance uh, in order also to emphasize the open uh, inclusive and participatory character of the open labs. Uh, the project tries to um, somehow connect the needs of migrants, refugees, and asylum seekers with the stakeholders that typically collaborate with our institutions and share the initiatives, some of the initiatives that uh, could raise awareness on what's going on in each institution. Uh, in order also to impact on our local communities and even university members to make them aware of um, the importance of the universities in this, in this topic. Uh, the project have found a proper match with ongoing projects and also has strengthened some of the uh, developments that were taking place in our different institutions, as you could see today and uh, it has been an active collaboration among uh, civic engagement task forces and open lab task force uh, which uh, have been uh, preparing the different activities in the uh, institutions and also reflecting or thinking thoroughly on on the impact that this may have uh, at a local level so that's all on my side. I would like to introduce Mike Osborne from University of Glasgow, who would like to he would like to present part of the, the University of Glasgow work in this area, and he's a, a large, uh, a great expertise uh, or has a great expertise on on the topic that could give a nice overview of what's going on here. So, Mike, please. Okay, thank you, Jose Luis. I can't pretend to have any great expertise on this particular topic, um, but I, I know something about what we do here at the university um, and also in the city. So I think the first thing we'd probably say in terms of community engagement is that the city of Glasgow has had a very long-standing commitment to the support of refugees and migrants and asylum seekers and um, is one of the most welcoming, if not the most welcoming city in the UK and openly encourages uh, refugees, migrants and asylum seekers to come here. Um, thinking about the university as, as a whole, um, it also has a long-standing tradition in terms of supporting uh, refugees, migrants and asylum seekers. And we could certainly say over the last two decades or so, um, there has been extensive research informed support for uh, this area of work notably led by Professor Alison Phipps. I don't know if Alison is online today, um, but I should play credit to her role in uh, developing this area of our work, um, not least uh, through the UNESCO Chair in Refugee Integration through Languages and the Arts, and also the Glasgow Refugees, Asylum Seekers and Migrants Network. This is why I have to read the text because I have to get all the acronyms uh, right. And th these are both uh, hosted uh, through the School of Education, which is part of the College of Social Sciences here. And um, I, was, I was previously Director of Research in the School of Education, so I have some sort of idea of what we're doing overall. And you know, was very impressed myself by seeing the extent of activity. Um, one could say that um, it was uh, an arts, humanities and uh, research, arts and humanities research council project. That's one of our research councils 
in the UK, a project called Researching uh, Multilinguality. Uh, that, um, sorry, re Researching Multilingually. Uh, that, that was the uh, first of the major projects that provided the basis for the UNESCO chair. Um, and now we've got um, all sorts of other very major projects here within the UNESCO share, including, for example, the South-South Migration Inequality and Development Hub, um, MEDEC, and I think you'll be hearing something about that later on, which was established with funding uh, through a major five-year uh, project funded by UK Research and Innovation, which is the which is the organization that oversees the individual research councils of the UK. And this is a really large 20 million pound project uh, of which the University of Glasgow is a part of one of a number of hubs that's been created by UKRI, UK Research and Innovation, inside the aegis of a major initiative in the UK uh, called the Global Challenges Research Fund. Um, that was an investment of some 1.5 billion pounds by the UK government into research uh, that was collaborative between UK universities and partners in the global south. A fantastic initiative. Sadly, um, uh, the, the, uh, the current government decided in its wisdom, of which it has relatively little, I suspect, in relation to international development, that they would cut this, their uh, contribution to overseas development aid from the 0.7% of GDP as recommended by the UN to 0.5% uh, around um, a year or so ago, with the consequent uh, effect that uh, many projects uh, were cut and we no longer have a Global Challenges uh, Research Fund. Okay, despite that, we have projects which are still running. And another project uh, under Alison's aegis is um, the Culture for Sustainable and Innovation Peace Network plus CUSP, uh, N plus is the acronym there, and I think we're going to hear from that as well. And that network um, draws together non-academic partners in the UK and, uh, and partners in low and middle income countries uh, in, as a reference point essentially for uh, issues of social conflict. So there's, there's an extensive portfolio of work that's going on here, not, not simply in Glasgow in relation to refugees and asylum seekers and, and migrants, but also working with the Global South as well, which is a, a very important part of the work that we do here at the university. And today, for those of you who are physically here, you're in the Advanced Research Centre, I think you know that by now. And, and we have as one of the six, as one of six major themes which has been embedded uh, um, in, in the ARC on the fifth floor, maybe some of you saw it yesterday, uh, not terribly evident yet because the, the building has only been open for a, a few weeks. Uh, uh, one of the six themes is sustainable international development and much of the work um, is going to be coordinated uh, through that area of the ARC. And also I was just looking uh, through uh, the pages of our School of Education and, and to see how many other projects that we have just in the School of Education, there will be projects that relate to this area across the whole university. Uh, but but th there's a whole raft of other things outside the aegis of the UNESCO chair and GRAMNET as well. And for instance, I run the Centre for Research and Development in Adult uh, Education, Adult and Lifelong Learning. And um, I was just looking at the sorts of things that some of my colleagues have been, have been doing recently. We've got a substantial focus on a range of different groups, uh, groups that are marginalised, disadvantaged within education by virtue of age, disability, gender, geography, incarceration, race and ethnicity, sexuality, et cetera, et cetera, and not least refugee uh, asylum seeker status. And I, I just look at the projects, building, building futures, aspirations of Syrian youth refugees and host population responses in Lebanon, Greece and the UK. Um, um, a project that I was involved in, which was around strengthening the urban engagement of universities in Asia and Africa, where we had a major focus on, on migration, uh, uh, forced and unforced migration uh, in a range of countries in the global south. But I could go on uh, with, with other examples, identity, citizenship and belonging amongst several Eastern European migrant children in the UK, uh, migrating medical professional knowledge. This is about professionals in, in the medical field coming to the UK and needing to reintegrate in society. 
And finally, I should say that we, we do work very closely with the Council for At-Risk Academics in the UK um, to help um, currently, of course, academics and families in Ukraine and the expertise of, of CARA, the Council for At-Risk Academics, has, has been vital. And we, we do value our very strong and long-standing relationship with that organisation and, and are making a series of financial commitments at the moment to students and to staff members from the Ukraine, academics in the Ukraine, uh, to come here to Glasgow to uh, continue their work. Um, in fact, I'm personally in the middle of an application at the moment to the British Academy to bring uh, a Ukrainian academic here uh, to, to Glasgow with great support from the institution. So that's just giving you a little taste of the, of the things that, that we're, we're doing here in Glasgow. Um, as I say, in my own school of education, it's a, it's a core area of work, but it's core to, to the work of a whole range of schools across the university. So that's all I need to say by way of introduction. And um, Ruth, are you continuing the, um, the coordination of, of speakers during the course of the morning, or is Jose Luis going yeah, to do that? Work? Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much. It's a great record of, of project. And one thing that you mentioned that uh, came to my mind now is that, uh, well, those projects that uh, are really worth it to implement and are cut off at some point by the government, public administration. I think uh, one of the roles of open labs and general cities is to help those uh, projects to continue, uh, to help somehow and to provide an environment also to, to make it possible. So I clearly encourage you to, to find uh, ways to, to introduce your, your ideas or even these uh, uh, nice uh, activities and, and proposals into the city's uh, environment because uh, some of them could, uh, could be um, would find a, a good continuity, uh, I think, in the in the alliance because it has the main elements to, to happen. So, uh, well, it's good that you that you mentioned that <laughs> that point. Um, okay, so let's continue with the um, with the presentation around the the initiative, the transnational initiative, and our project. Uh, we'll start uh, hearing from Bucharest uh, to Alina Tigao and Alina uh, Marcy uh, about the, the activities that take place there. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. My name is uh, Alina Tigao, and I'm from the University of Bucharest. Uh, I'm uh, one of the members of the Open Lab uh, team, coordinated by Professor Magdalena Batis. Um, and uh, together we have been um, running the open lab in our uh, university. Um, so, uh, okay, so I should get, uh, let me see how this works. Given that it is a PDF, I think I should manage it from here. Yeah, there's a way I need to. No, no. I'm just trying to make it. Okay, now maybe. All right, so uh, together we had uh, two calls within the Open Lab project. We launched the first call in December 2020 and the second one in September 2021. For the four, first call, we had, as you can see here, 14 proposals. We selected three of them and gave them our seed money. And for the second call, we had five proposals. And again, we um, decided to finance uh, three of them. We ended up with uh, these uh, six projects, uh, people in trees. Uh, we actually paid attention for each of these projects to come up from, from a different uh, line of 
uh, let's say, orientation. So we have people and trees, services for the accessibility of learning contents and educational support for children, uh, science for resilience, and then in call two, uh, urban lakes, microscounts, traveling laboratory, and science for all. Uh, we also have a transnational uh, project, uh, but I will pass on the word to my other colleague, who happens to bear the same name as myself, uh, unlike many other Romanians, of course, and who will present the transnational initiative that he is that, that she is in charge with. Hi, uh, this will be my first time at the microphone, so if it it's it's becoming uh, annoying, just let me know. I can also speak very loud because I have a bit of experience. So yes, of course. Uh, hi, my name is Alina Maric. Uh, I work uh, together with uh, Professor Liana Dimitrake at the University of Bucharest. Uh, our special, we come from the Faculty of Geography. So uh, our approach on this, uh, in this initiatives was based on our assets, what we usually do, how we uh, uh, tackle any task. Um, I will confess, uh, I came to Glasgow with one type of presentation, but uh, after yesterday's activities, because one of the last question is how is today uh, today's activity uh, change anything for you? Um, I have tried to, to um, encompass uh, yesterday's questions and discussions on words and what do they actually mean. Um, into presenting our preliminary results. So, yes. The, the aim, let's put it like this, the aim was first of all to find out, to find out um, geographers work in the field. So they go in the field, they see um, a geomorphological uh, event, they measure it, they take samples, they come back, and then they present their, their researches. So our, our first step was, okay, we have to go in the field. Our aim was find out what is happening in the field and put parts together, put them in dialogue. What has happened um, in Romania for the longest time, let's put it like this. Um, people have uh, existed, developed um, like islands. We are not a very um, ho homogeneous, let's put it like this, type of country. We have groups of people, migrants and refugees being one of them, but there are uh, not enough um, instruments of these islands connecting either with academia or with uh, policymakers or directly with uh, the administration itself. So our aim was to discover as much as possible what is the reality and create the channel. Our uh, way of creating the channel was to end this transnational uh, initiative with an uh, event where we invite people from different um, places and publish a research of our findings. Um, first, the first step was um, having an overview of uh, what was happening. First, the first uh, part was obtaining um, an image of the le existing legislation on what uh, the migrants or uh, refugees' uh, rights were, obligation, and so on. Um, because Obtaining um, an exact framework of their uh, categories would enable us to further um, obtain and compare statistical data and see where we go. Do, what do we look 
in the field? What kind of questions do we create when we discuss with them? Um, so before, when a person comes, uh, according to our legislation, they are either asylum seekers, after which, depending on the type of protection they would like to, uh, to require, they become refugees or, or subsidiary protection. Uh, we also have a lot of migrants with the legal right to stay in Romania, either because they came to work, to study, or family reunification. There is another uh, status um, of tolerated person. And yesterday's discussion about words and how what a word means to different persons, tolerated in Romania has a little bit of a negative connotation. So uh, you've done something maybe not very good, but we're going to tolerate you. This is not the case. So legally, a tolerated person is a person that is in danger that cannot prove it, but is in danger because the country they're coming from is known internationally for not respecting human rights and so on and so forth. Uh, the last legally legal status and has been implemented recently, particularly to address the Ukraine uh, status, is the temporary protection status, or these people uh, can apply to become temporary residents, which is different from refugees. And I'm gonna, uh, hopefully, if I don't take too long, I'm gonna um, give you specific examples. Um, just a very short uh, visual presentation of the number of people who, ca who came um, up to 2021 from 2014, um, depending on their age group. I'm sorry, these, these are adults and these are the uh, elderly population. So our main um, target group due to the specific of the transnational uh, initiatives regarding uh, measuring access to education and health would be the younger ones. Uh, the main, um, and you can see there is a, quite a strong difference on between genders. Males tend to, to um, predominate, especially in adults and um, even a little bit in the elderly category. The main sources of migrants and refugees are uh, countries like Afghanistan, Syria, Iraq. Uh, and because of these, again, differences can appear in their access, especially access to education, especially um, for the, the younger ones. Um, another thing that we have done was to uh, inquire, okay, who helps these people? They come here. The state, although they have the, the main um, prerogative to deal with them, uh, but who does it in the field? And we have... Um, <laughs> sorry, uh, so we have um, um, research if there are, and these were based, of course, from our own knowledge and from the, the literature reviews that we have done. And what we discovered that there is a, a stronger network of NGOs, associations, foundations that deal or help these people, either uh, started from uh, Romanian citizens that would like to help, or from the first waves of refugees that then became, became citizens and um, did their best to um, help them. So this would be a map of where they are. Um, and what I would like to, to uh, just very uh, fast uh, connect with the Ukrainian situation. So, uh, many of them are uh, located here. This would be the Northeast Development Region of Romania. Economically, it is one of the least developed of all the regions. 
what uh, why this region became important recently it is one of the main it is one of the main uh, incoming points for Ukrainians so that is where one this is where one of the border crossing happens and this is another one and of course this is where the capital city is located highest number of, uh, of people coming and accordingly highest number of associations um, what we did in the field um, we went to some of these associations and we talked to them what is your expertise what is your experience what are the barriers what are the problems are there any problems so, um, and we uh, we tried to keep a balance between um, who started these associations. So they would have they would be maybe members of the um, first waves of uh, migrants that came here, or uh, something else. After these uh, discussions, we created an interview guide, let's put it like this. The discussions with associations were free, uh, free flowing. So everybody could uh, discuss whatever they, they uh, wanted to, to share. Um, I'm not sure I can maybe access, I can't access it, <laughs> okay. Um, it is, it is, it's not a very um, long list of, um, questions basically we asked them what was their experience of accessing health or education uh, whether their barriers were um, related to financial issues language issues social issues legal issues um, what was their generally what was their most uh, the, the most difficult challenge that they faced if they were able to, to overcome it and how. Again, the same for, for health. And then uh, we usually ended the, the discussion, generally, what was your best experience? What was your worst? Just to have an, an overview of, because you remember your, big, your highest and lowest. So we went with this in the field. I went at the end of April. I went here in the north and I discussed mostly with Ukrainians. Migrant camps that were set up in gyms near uh, stadiums or through uh, priests the various parishes that were hosting migrants. Olivier asked me yesterday, what was your engagement? How do, how do you measure your engagement? Um, and I think after everything and after thinking about this um, during yesterday and, and uh, last night, through these individual stories, to their stories. So um, we got, I'm going to come back to our findings because we have to, even if it is very difficult to find a one cup fits all situation, I'm going to um, uh, try to tell you some individual stories and, and with a sort of con conclusion. Most of the statistically, a million and 20,000 Ukrainians have entered Romania since the crisis started. 80,000 remained. There are uh, 40,000 requiring requests for temporary residents, 4,000 asylum seekers. The difference between temporary residents and asylum seekers, the people that request temporary residents are free to go back. They're freer to, to um, circulate back and forth. Why is this important? 
time and time again, what we heard was, my plan is to go back. Um, I will try to continue with my children's studies here. And what we found was that even in the camps that were set up in the gyms, they would, sorry, <laughs> Uh, they would continue with online classes. This was in the context of the pandemic, which was uh, had brought us online classes, but they were uh, keeping, still keeping in contact with the, the teachers that were back home and continuing their, their, uh, their education uh, like that. Um, again, since the crisis started, there have been 2,500 requests for young children to uh, enroll in uh, schools, mostly in Bucharest, because um, those were the better seen, let's put it like that. Um, and the, the difficulties, the barriers, the hindrance, the most important one was language. When I didn't have a translator with me, as a, a, just a short break, my father worked as a translator for me because his parents are of Ukrainian background. So they, at home, they spoke a sort of Ukrainian. So whenever I didn't have a, a translator with me, we would use Google Translate or different apps that uh, they themselves had to communicate in English. So Ukrainian to Romanian, very, it was very difficult. Romanian itself is a very difficult language to, to understand uh, and learn, unfortunately. Um, and these were the, the barriers regarding the, the Ukrainians on education, on health. Because they receive temporary residence status, what we find out, what we found out from them, but also from the associations that we talked to, this status is a little bit of a fast track. So everything happens a little bit. If I'm going overboard, just signal me a little bit. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, they do not have to go through so many um, um, bureaucratic um, steps to receive basic uh, health and basic education. One problem uh, was that by making this incredibly easier, the backlash from the local doctors started to, to uh, feel very strongly because they uh, and the associations told us doctors cannot deal with uh, such a large number of requests because they would have to automatically enroll them, whether they need it or not, but in most cases they do need it. I'm going to go to the next <laughs> uh, group of migrants and refugees, which are uh, those coming from Afghanistan, Syria, and um, they have uh, an old uh, tradition coming from Romania. In the 17th, in the 19th, uh, 80s to the 19th, uh, Romania was, tar was their target uh, for education. They, so they would primarily come to get a degree. Uh, our educational system was seen as very good and the country was seen as very cheap. Uh, in the one of the, the interviewers said, okay, I would be able to live. I started my education in France. It started to become very expensive for me. So I chose to continue it and finish it in Romania because with the same amount of money that I would survive in France, even if I was a smoker, which was important, uh, I would be able to survive uh, for a month, for example. So that was the first wave. The, uh, they came primarily for uh, education. They were above average income. And in the collective mentality, this idea of people who come, those people who come are okay financially. They're not rich, but they are richer than us at that point. They had access to more, uh, and this is um, um, 
a whole different discussion of uh, the courses that the the courses that the organization uh, organized, the association organized, cannot be certified. One thing that we could do and make uh, their integration into education better is to certify these courses because they are uh, organized with teaching staff that are paid. So a little bit maybe that uh, um, pushed to, to offer better services. Thank you. I'm so sorry I took so long. Okay. Well, thank you. Alina, uh, it's clear that uh, Bucharest has changed uh, its perspective, perhaps in the recent uh, times uh, about migration. And I'm sure your ideas uh, would be heard and, and probably uh, carried out in, in, in the short or medium. <laughs> okay, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, let's continue with, the, I think, Dan, Dr. Dan Fisher, a postdoctoral researcher with UNESCO RILA, will introduce the new Scots Refugee Integration Strategy for us. Please, Dan. Uh, Sorry. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that works. Do you want to just like that? Uh, uh, sorry, I forgot what's here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yeah, I think so. Uh, okay, so my talk follows on from uh, Professor Osborne's uh, introduction to the work that we're doing at Glasgow University. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm Dan Fisher and I work with Professor Alison Phipps uh, at the UNESCO, who is the UNESCO Chair for Refugee Integration Through Languages and the Arts. Uh, today I'll be introducing our work on the New Scots Refugee Integration Development Project. Uh, but to do that, first I'll give you some background information on uh, refugee integration in Scotland. So, and the UK. So, in the UK, immigration policy is a reserved area of the UK government. And uh, my colleague Pinar will later talk a bit more about uh, UK government policies, I think. Uh, but responsibility for refugee integration is devolved to the Scottish government. Um, and this means that in Scotland, we have a strange system where people seeking asylum on the one hand, have to deal with the UK government's hostile environment, but on the other hand, they are also welcomed by the Scottish government. And the New Scots uh, strategy is basically the mechanism for which integration has been organised. And it's a unique integration strategy for various reasons, but first and foremost, it's unique because it's a partnership between national government, so the Scottish government, local government, which is represented through COSLA and the Scottish Refugee Council. And this partnership is chaired by the University of Glasgow's Alison Phipps. Uh, so in consultation with... Oh my God, man, I'm all over there. It's happening. It's happening, God. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's definitely a Zoom bomber. No, that's okay. Do I keep going or do I wait? Okay. Uh, so uh, a few things to note. Um, the term New Scots refers both to refugees and people seeking asylum. And in consultation with New Scots, uh, seven key themes were identified for the strategy. These are the needs of asylum seekers, employability and welfare rights, housing, education, 
language, health and well-being, and communities, cultures, and connections. So I mentioned previously that the strategy is unique. Uh, there are two more aspects of the strategy that I would like to highlight. First, the strategy operates on an integration from day one approach. This means that unlike most other national strategies, uh, people seeking asylum are included in the strategy as opposed to only people with refugee status. And ah. secondly, and secondly, the strategy is centered on a rights-based approach. Uh, this means that the strategy highlights what rights uh, people with refugee status and, and who are seeking asylum have, and it also shares how they are able to access these rights. So eagle-eyed viewers will have been able to see that uh, the new Scott strategy runs from 2018 to 2022. This means that the strategy is due for renewal next year. Uh, and it's in this context that the new Scots Refugee Integration uh, Delivery Project was set up. And that's the project that we're working on. And the aims of the project are fourfold. Uh, first and second, the project has funded local authorities and third sector organizations to share existing good practices and to create new integration practices. Third, the project aims to conduct research concerning refugee integration in Scotland in order to inform the next iteration of the strategy. And fourth, we're hoping to develop uh, an international exemplar of integration in Scotland, which we can share internationally. Uh, so what's the work that we're doing as part of this? Uh, so on a theoretical level, we're considering what integration means, depending on the context in which it's deployed. So we're comparing how the term integration is understood in policy, how it's understood in legal settings, cultural events, and places where governance is resisted. Uh, we've also analyzed Scottish government policy documents that relate to refugees and new Scots in general in order to establish what evidence is used in these policy documents and how it's cited. Uh, this combines with another of our aims, which has been to collect and synthesize all the academic work conducted in Scotland on new Scots since 2014. Uh, and we're also comparing the New Scots strategy against other national refugee integration strategies in order to see what practices Scotland could adopt. Uh, and then lastly, we have two MRES projects uh, also who are focusing on language in the context of refugee integration. Uh, so as I mentioned, this work that we're doing is primarily aimed at assisting the development of the next iteration of the new Scots integration policy. Uh, there are a number of additional challenges that the strategy has to face. Uh, these include the war in Ukraine and the ongoing crisis in Afghanistan. Uh, and just as pressing will be the effects of uh, new UK government immigration legislation, which the Scottish government will have to um, deal with. Uh, in terms of next steps, we're soon organizing a workshop with stakeholders in Scotland to sense check our findings, and then we'll be applying for funds to further to develop further workshops and share uh, our knowledge internationally next year. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, well, I hope that uh, also you have the chance to compare with the national policies across uh, cities uh, inside your project. Uh, uh, what are your sources, by the way, when you compare with other national policies? How, how did you get that information from? Uh, yeah, so, well, we've actually just been Googling, trying to find uh, Romania's integration strategy. Okay. Uh, so we'll ask you about that later. Um, yeah, so the uh, European Union has quite a helpful um, repository of uh, policies regarding integration. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the hardest challenges is that how each country formulates these strategies is very different. So Scotland has a strategy, Finland has an act, Belgium has devolved everything to a local level. Mm -hmm. uh, Similarly, in Germany, it's all at federal level. So, no, sorry, so, yeah, Bundesland level. So, working out how to compare between these both types of documents and then types of 
yeah, level is really mm -hmm. hard. So that's part of the part of the reason for doing this is that we want to be able to see what how yeah, how is the integration planned at local level elsewhere? Mm -hmm. What is called a local plan. So I think it's part of the research. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, let's move on. Uh, next speaker will be Salan Kabir, Emerging Leader with the John Smith Institute and Project Manager with Refugees for Justice. Next, Salan. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Savan and uh, I work with Dan and I work in Refugee for Justice. I'm glad to be here and thank you for uh, inviting me to be here. So today I'm going to talk about asylum and refugee support in Scotland. Uh, uh, Dan has spoken about the new sort of integration strategy and it was good to see how it worked, you know. So I'm, I'm the evidence kind of thing for, for what Dan said to Dan. What you said and and uh, the good work of New Scotland Integration Strategy and other organisations has been. So I'm I'm just gonna uh, I, I hope it's not sounds like a TED talk. It, it talks a lot about me, me, what I've done, what I've achieved, and uh, trying to motivate people. But I started my journey at the uh, with John Smith Centre. So it was in the middle of the COVID pandemic. I just recently got my visa in 2020. So I have no surprise that I'm a refugee. Uh, so I was looking for an opportunity to put my foot in the door. I had I was volunteering uh, for many years, but it's very hard. One of the one of the challenges refugees are facing is in, is, is employment opportunity among other things. But a uh, John Smith Center was I uh, published this program. So the program was emergency uh, uh, trying to get in uh, people VMA groups and refugee background, trying to provide opportunities. The opportunity was linking. Uh, individuals to other organization and agencies uh, it, it, to learn and uh, to grow and to exercise what they already uh, the skills they already have so John Smith Center uh, linked me with UNESCO RILA uh, and I was greeted by Dr. Dan the first day and I, I found myself very privileged to work in that organization because mainly it's about refugees and and, and the policy around it it's, it's very good to have linked experience I would say, and we, my work with UNESCO RILA starts giving me more opportunities, and like uh, from, uh, participating in a in a project, refugee journalism project, which is also a project is based in London, University of London, uh, running the uh, the project. Uh, it's for those journalists being uh, coming to coming to the UK, but uh, because. Of the language barriers, or because of many other barriers that are facing people coming from a different country, because they knew they don't they don't have a network. So, refugee journalism project is a connecting journalists uh, to uh, like many other uh, journalist uh, news agencies, and actually is like training and inviting senior journalists and coming and talk to them. And also, they have fellowships. So, the refugees and, and the people. They're mainly refugees and the people participating in the refugee journalism project actually uh, they have a chance to apply for fellowship and the fellowship is going to be a full-time job so it's like another way to gain people uh put their, their foot in the door another way and actually as, uh, and, and after that I, I had an opportunity to start working at refugees for justice as project manager refugees for justice just to give you a quick a uh, little background it's a campaigning organization refugee-led organ uh, refugee and asylum uh, seekers-led organization. Uh, and the work, is some of the work I've done with Venus Corella, uh, it was around nationality and borders bill. So it was mainly I was focusing uh, or before the nationality and borders bill become an act. Uh, we were looking at the pull factors because the nationality and borders bill was uh, presented because there are pull factors, people coming to this country because this and that. So we were trying to find out is there actually any pull factor or what the government seems a pull factor? Is there really a pull factor? So uh, we wrote and uh, we published a blog in the Glasgow University uh, website for UNESCO Rella page. 
So we actually found there's there's little or no evidence at all between the pull factors and the reason people come in here. So what we found out was actually people coming to the UK because more about the language ties and colonial relationship than a, a, a job, a kind of kind of driven. So and also we we were we didn't know it's going to be Rwanda, but we had we had a sense because they were talking about the uh, offloading uh, asylum seekers somewhere. So we knew this offshoring. It's going to be one of the one of one of the agendas, and they were trying to push. And we actually studied some of the uh, uh, some of the similar model, like Australian model, and we found uh, the the uh, the policy is not working, and, and the cost is extortionate, and the cost of a uh, uh, human human right of use is 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 too much to bear. Um, and they actually, we also look at Australian and, and Mexico, uh, sorry, American, USA and, and uh, Mexico borders and Greece and Turkey borders when they implemented more, more border and uh, it didn't stop people uh, crossing the channel or crossing the, crossing the border, it, it only increased the risk. Uh, so more border was actually more riskier for, for the people crossing the border. It wasn't less number uh, crossing. Uh, and also just to, and one of uh, one of the other things we've we've done with UNESCO Rila was publishing articles uh, uh, for the national mainly. We have a good connection with, with the national actually. So we publish now uh, the the work we do at UNESCO Rila, and actually we thought it's, it's, it would be good. So we we share that research or blog post, whatever we do with the public as well. Because sometimes uh, some of the research are segregated just for academia, and the public uh, doesn't. Uh, not really know or not aware of uh, uh, the, the good work of the uh, academics doing as well. So we thought it would be a good idea to publish in articles. And these are some of the uh, articles I uh, published with Dr. Dan and with, with others as well. And also I've, uh, I've worked on preparing evidence paper for the Scottish government, the new Scots integration strategy evidence paper, which was uh, collecting the, uh, the researchers, uh, like from, from researchers coming and they were studying the new, uh, New Scott integration strategy and um, uh, their findings on New Scott, the New Scott integration strategy. So it was about eight, nine, something like that. So I had to put in a two page. It was a hard job, ever. Uh, it was done. And actually now I'm currently working with, uh, with Dan on, on uh, Dr. Dan on the new uh, research project, which was comparing uh, comparing an integration strategy from other countries, uh, trying to find out how other countries see integration and uh, what are uh, what are their policies. And uh, it's it's also going to be a book chapter, so it will be a book chapter with me and I will be particip participating in. Uh, and also just a little bit of work about uh, on my work on refugees for justice, which is. It's important because one of the elements of integration is housing and what's going on in in Scotland, the issues reserved and devolved matter, it, it creates a lot of chaos. Um, if housing is the, it's a private companies is providing housing for asylum seekers and refugees. And during uh, during COVID uh, until now, Mears Group is a private company, uh, which is uh, contracted by the Home Office. Uh, they're providing housing and support provision for asylum seekers uh, in Scotland. So Mears Group in 2020, during COVID, moved more than 321 asylum seekers to, uh, to the hotels in Glasgow. Actually, they, and actually uh, very strangely, many of them from their safe accommodation. So the time was uh, uh, everyone was trying to be isolated and trying to take keep themselves away from gathering, large gathering, Mears groups start moving hundreds of people in hotel, all in sharing one kitchen. And uh, uh, it was it was little uh, sense of what they were doing. And what happened in the process, the process was they had lots of shortcoming. So there was no proper vulnerability assessment putting people, uh, there were no vulnerability assessment with lack of uh, access to healthcare and mental health support. There was little or no financial support for the individual who were kept in a hotel uh, for months. And uh, the hotel staff were actually not trained because asylum seekers and refugees have their different needs and you, you, you need to be well trained uh, to know how to respond to their needs. And uh, the staff were uh, untrained and asylum seekers keep in, kept in the hotel for over six months and some of them more than that. And 
to evidence what I've said, the, the chaos. So unfortunately what happened, it was in the 26th of June, 2020, six people were stabbed. One person shot dead by, a poli uh, by police in the hotel. The person who started the uh, attack was a asylum seeker. But after that, BBC, uh, after long months, after many months, BBC found out this individual asked the home office uh, 72 times, home office and mirrors to say, it, he was suffering mentally and he was actually asking the home office to even send him back to his country but his calls being ignored 72 times and led to the tragedy the parking tragedy in, in Glasgow and refugee for justice I established right after that a, a incident one of the co-founders is Pinar uh, with with Dylan so they established this organization refugee for justice to ask for independent inquiry because there was no investigation, proper investigation in the incident, as if like it doesn't even matter what happened. Uh, they were trying to uh, brush it under the carpet, but Refugee for Justice established then and asked for public inquiry since an independent inquiry. Their calls and our calls been reaching the deaf ears from, from, uh, for many months and, and years, but finally we managed to get the independent inquiry in the 26th of uh, exactly the same day the incident happened, the 26th of June 2020. Um, the independent inquiry is been launched and chaired by one of the lady partners here in Kennedy. And also, uh, three days later, we, we managed to go to the court, Royal Court of Justice in London. We were challenging the Home Office to trigger Article 3 compliant public inquiry into the parking incident. But also, uh, what, was, uh, what was the rationale behind moving asylum seekers from the safe accommodation to hotels during COVID? What we think individually, we think personally, we think it was a profit driven uh, policy. So that's from me, and uh, thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Savan. Well, there's a, a point, at least in Spain, of a lot of pressure as well. Uh, the border between Morocco and Melilla and Ceuta are very hot points there to, to conduct a research perhaps on, on the field, you know, because uh, uh, as you said, the, the increase of borders make, uh, increases the risk and that is obvious in this case. So probably uh, if you are interested in some point, uh, I could try to contact people uh, with uh, expertise in, in the ground. Uh, to help you out if you want to to go on and, and get a deeper insight on what's going on there that's so maybe, thank you. yeah it matches perfectly your what you were saying before so that's perfect thank you all right well uh, i think it's time to move on uh next speaker should be me <laughs> presenting the work of uh, uam and the transnational project Yeah, perfect. Uh, is this good? That's fine. All right. Well, uh, I'm presenting today the the activities that uh, UAM performed in the context of the of the project. Uh, those activities took place uh, under the coordination of the Vice Rectorate for Social Commitment and Sustainability. Uh, first of the activities uh, had to do with a workshop that we organized in March, uh, end of March, uh, called University and Migratory Processes. And the idea was to set up roundtables uh, with the university community, especially students and professors with migrant background, and different stakeholders, especially NGOs. Uh, that openly discuss on the involvement of the university in the global uh, scenario of migration and support to the uh, refugees. Uh, the event included four of these roundtables with different topics uh, dedicated, for instance, to the present and future challenges for reception and integration of uh, refugees in Spain, the role of the university in the migration processes from the training, research, and institutional commitment perspective, the analysis of the refugee migration tra trajectories and uh, the keys for understanding the humanitarian crisis in Ukraine. 
Uh, we had uh, several recordings and interviews to some of the speakers from different backgrounds. And well, the, the video is publicly available in YouTube. Uh, I was going to uh, today to play a clip, but um, there was no time really to, to set up the video. Uh, it was a very short clip, but I could uh, share with you uh, later the, the link so you could all uh, visualize it. Uh, second, yeah. second activity had to do with the, the program that uh, was launched uh, at the university for called mobility uh, in relationship with the SDGs and global citizenship. And the idea is to offer university students the opportunity to learn uh, through on-site internships in social and environmental projects in southern countries, in particular in Benin and Colombia. Uh, their experiences are taking place uh, between June and September and are a fruitful collaboration also uh, with uh, NGOs and, and local entities there. Um, And the third activity has to do with the uh, occasion of the UAM Cooperation Office anniversary at our university. Uh, we plan to, um, to prepare an artistic mural uh, to symbolize actually the intangible heritage of the university in terms of cultural and ethnical uh, diversity. Uh, also taking advantage of the knowledge and learning of those citizens that uh, are forced uh, to come to our country and specifically to our university uh, to continue their studies and are more sensitive to our societal uh, barriers. So uh, we could reflect that in a tangible way uh, through this mural and acknowledge uh, their learnings and, and make them visible to the uh, university members and visitors. So the main outputs we got from, from the project was on one side, the awareness was an awareness tool for us. Uh, we uh, had the chance to involve more university members in the issues related to, to migration and the issues that migrants and refugees found when they arrived at our university. Uh, UAM, I must say that is pioneer in this area in, in Spain, so it's helping other universities to introduce uh, policies and procedures um, and, and the material that we produce and the discussions uh, can be helpful also even the program to, to show up how we think that uh, can be uh, addressed the, the, the issue in general or the challenge. Uh, the, um, the results are also having some impact in the stakeholders because new collaboration has been planned uh, after the, the, especially the workshop we had with them. Uh, there was a, a solution uh, that we discussed during the workshop and it was the importance of uh, having more innovation, technological innovation in the refugee camps. It's something that uh, we would like to explore with them uh, in the in the next months and, and years, how to connect the uh, knowledge uh, at the university at a technical level with the uh, needs of the refugees there, especially in the northern countries of um, uh, African countries, um, and also to establish collaboration ships and internships, perhaps of the students towards those camps uh, to to help uh, in in that task. Uh, also, uh, it has had an internal impact uh, to exceed actually the values of the university and the civic engagement character of our alliance to our uh, people, uh, to our university uh, members that um, are, I think, more aware now of uh, the role of the university in this, in this area. So, and that's all uh, from Madrid, I think. Uh, we can, I don't know if you have any question or no? related to the project. Okay, if not, 
we can move on. I think next one is Anna Kalstedt uh, from Stockholm University. And Anna is online. Anna, can you hear us? Yes, thank you so much. Uh, actually, I will uh, give uh, the floor um, immediately to my colleague uh, Ivar Björkman, who is the coordinator of the Open Lab in Stockholm. So he will start and uh, then I will um, come back with a few words a bit later. Thanks. Yes. Hello, everybody. Uh, is it possible to share a screen? Because I'm trying. We, yeah, we're on it. <laughs> I'm trying to share a screen here, but I'm not. Okay. Host disabled participant. Share screen. Yeah, we're working on it. Yeah, try now, please. Yes, now it works. Let's see. And now I will go back here. And then I will do like that. Do you see now? Yes. Good. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, uh, when we started talking about our project, we we started immediately to talk about how can, what are the universities doing? What's what's happening for, what is the role here for the universities to to match the students with the background of migrants and refugees with higher education. And then we found out, and of course, Anna is part of that, very much part of that, that we have very good examples from our partner universities where we, we are matching the competence of the immigrants and refugees having with the higher, with the higher education competence, but which they need a, uh, uh, identification, special identification, the local identification. So they need to actually go to the Swedish universities to, to, to be able to get jobs. And we also looking have been looking on to, because there are certain types of professions in Sweden where the state is giving some financial support to the universities to handle this, to work with this type of education, this, this type of programs. And one of these uh, professions is the teachers, teachers for, for, for in schools. So, and we of course have also been for nurses and for doctors and so forth. There are certain areas where, the, but we started as, as Stockholm University has has very much these competences and are working and has examples of programs where we are working with that. So that was kind of our starting point in our discussion when we talked about what, what our project would. And then we start to think, okay, who shall we invite? Because we were of course planning and thinking about how can we, arrange a workshop or something that where we can show the have examples of best practice and of course looking into what are the actual challenges ongoing now so we did a stakeholder mapping with different um, organizations that we invited to this workshop that we had the may 10th and the stakeholders that we uh, that we choose or that we found out was important of course uh, was the universities themselves, those who are actually doing these type of programs, but also the city of Stockholm, as Open Lab has city of Stockholm as our one of our core partners at Open Lab, and of course uh, Stockholm University has it very much also collaboration with the Stockholm city of Stockholm. And what are they doing? What's happening there? And then we also uh, invited the Swedish Council for Higher Education because these are in Sweden, who most responsible for giving what type of uh, uh, how should this how should this look like and what was should be the criteria and so forth, and we were lucky. We had the the most important person from this organization participating in our workshop, and that 
was for us is kind of uh, not easy people to get get hold of to come to to participate so we were very happy to have them and then we also have the Swedish Public Employment Service people from that organization because they're of course very very important for that and then we of course tried to invite civic organizations but when we started this planning this uh, the Ukraine situation was not has not started so when we try now to, when we try to invite uh, these organizations, they were so much occupied what what's about the Ukraine situation. So we had actually little difficulties to to uh, get them to come to join us. But we have so we had the Ukraine Forum, for example, which is an organization in, in in Stockholm that works with that. So we mapped out then uh, three different stakeholders. That one part is the uh i can see here i change here you see here so we looked into okay so we had the stakeholders we had the the local authorities we had the universities and we also wanted to invite the industry because in the sense of industry those who are employing these people so it's it's uh, uh, so it's a broad sense of what we mean by industry and then we looked into, okay, what can we get out of this when we arranged this, when we had this workshop for, for a day in, in May? What, what is the best, best practice? What is the challenge that we are facing? And from the university's perspective, of course, one of the main challenge for the university is the documentation for validation. But of course, also time, because it takes a lot of time. It's uh, time consuming. It's uh, not an easy thing to, to handle this for the university. And on the one hand, also, of course, the economic situation, the economy, even though it's supported by the states, it's still the economic situation. And I don't know, Anna, would you put in some what challenges more we had from the university sides when we when we discuss this. Yes, uh, sure. Um, one of, um, of the challenges uh, at our university is to, um, um, to actually try to um, uh, meet the shortage of, of some, uh, some groups in, in society. For example, Sweden currently has a huge uh, shortage of teachers. And no matter how many we educate at the university, there's still this shortage. Uh, so um, we, we have been asking ourselves, um, uh, could this be a, a possibility to actually, um, to actually uh, match um, the, um, uh, the higher education uh, with uh, the the skills uh, that uh, migrants and refugees and or refugees already have and um, this has been um, when you do that in Sweden you you kind of enter a quite controversial discourse I would like to say we have all our experiences from the huge situation we have in had in 2015 with with all the refugees from Syria where you where you had this very unpleasant uh, discourse in Sweden that uh, the refugees uh, coming to Sweden was like a burden to the Swedish society and that uh, it was too many and how could we handle that this as a, as a society and so on but what we saw at the universities um, in our capacities was that um, on the contrary, you know, it was really a, a, an opportunity for us. There were, for instance, there were thousands of teachers uh, coming from Syria. And uh, to us working at the university, it was very difficult to, for us to understand how could this be a burden to the society. For us, for us it's really um, uh, uh, extremely uh, rich opportunity for us. To, uh, to actually meet the shortage, shortage that we have. 
And uh, we developed uh, the, um, you see the, the um, abbreviation there, ULV, uh, meaning in Swedish, uh, the Foreign Teaching uh, Teachers Bridging Program that we developed a lot during 2015 and looking for how could we, uh, in an easier and a shorter way for, for foreign teachers, uh, already having a, a degree uh, to, to get them on board on the Swedish system and, and to help them to, to start working at, as teachers. And the same, exact same thing is happening now with, uh, with uh, thousands of teachers from the Ukraine coming to Sweden um, and uh, already working now in the Swedish school. Um, and the whole idea of the of the foreign teachers uh, bridging program uh, in in, the, uh, in our university is that you you do not need to have every document in order. You know, it's not always easy if you come from uh, Eritrea or Afghanistan or Syria or the Ukraine um, with the war going on to have all your papers in order when you come to the university. But, but there we saw, um, uh, Eva mentioned one of our authorities where we have um, a system um, called uh, valuation uh, without all the documents needed. So uh, different authorities are working together with uh, the authorities, for instance, in the original country uh, and with other universities to, to put uh, the documents needed together and also to, to very quickly have uh, language courses uh, within the universal system. So, so um, what we have tr been trying to develop is um, how can we um, help um, uh, migrant teachers and um, refugees teachers on board uh, quicker and do it with within the university system. So you don't need to have everything ready when you come and. Um, uh, this um, workshop was very valuable to us, especially to, dis to discuss with the Nordic Ukraine Forum, which is a very important NGO in Sweden now, uh, to discuss with them uh, uh, what, which are the challenges, uh, what, what hindrances can you see, what can we do to make this easier. So, so in order to, so within the framework of, of the um, of the transnational project uh, within CIVIS, we actually had this beautiful opportunity to see how uh, the universities could work more together with the NGOs and the local authorities and as Eva said, uh, the industry, because um, me myself coming from the Swedish civil society, uh, for instance, I have been working for many years for the Swedish Red Cross, I see that um, we have a very vivid uh, civil society in Sweden, uh, a lot of NGOs, but not always we are very good at working together. Uh, we are working like in uh, isolated islands or uh, on, uh, on different planets, but we, uh, when we try to actually do something together, all the authorities, universities, NGOs, we see that things are really happening. And I also, uh, I will... Um, stop here but, but before i do that i <coughs> i also want to thank you for this transnational project because we have learned so much now during the spring when we have seen uh, the the projects that you have laid out on other universities we have learned so much on how you are are managing this uh, to to reach out to the civil society and to, to work together with them, how, how, um, how the universities and the NGOs can actually work together. And um, uh, I love the examples from Romania, but also from, from all the other countries. So I, I really think that this has been a beautiful opportunity for us to, to really you know, uh, learn from each other. So thank you. Uh, back to Ivar. Yes, thank you, Anna. No, I mean, it's really, it's, it's so interesting to hear the other presentation. It's really, really exciting and very important. I think one, one uh, other best practice I can mention here is what we call the shortcut, which is, the, is, is mostly run by the Swedish Public Employment Service, which helps those with, a, with an academic uh, degree or academic studies, uh, refugees or immigrants, 
and to support them and take a six months courses uh, to get the jobs in to work with the universities and that's another example of a uh, initiative that is it's is going on and I'm just gonna see how I cannot I cannot change my slide oops how oh, what's crazy now uh, here if we talk about local authorities there was of course as Anna mentioned what's the challenges it's uh, it's a question about who is responsible for what and that was kind of one of the learning outcomes when we did this workshop was that these people these different groups of people in different representations has not actually met so so much and that we were a little surprised about that but it uh, it, uh, it it played really good role for for doing us that so it was also that creating a kind of an awareness of support that is actually offered by other actors and stakeholders uh, and then of course this narrative of new arrived scenes as a resource or, or a problem and that's of course is, is something that comes back in many many of the discussions and here we have some uh, uh, best practice uh, information sweden which is the state uh, information sites about uh, how, how you have you as uh, assume seekers in in different language and from newly arrived to newly employed it's also it's run by the city of Stockholm and, and it's also working co in collaboration with the, the, the program that uh, Anna was mentioned. And then there is a welcome house in the city of Stockholm, uh, which uh, supports new arrival in, the, in its cross sector collaboration and it's uh, very well functioning in the city of Stockholm. So, and then industry <clears throat> or companies or the employ those who are employing these the people uh here we can see that one thing that was coming back in the discussion is uh time economy and pred just judges and uh there is this uh, kind of thing that they don't have the organizations today are so how do you say rationalized and so slim that they don't have any staff or have any people in the organization working with this with this uh, challenge which makes it more more difficult for them to handle this um, to work with it but there is examples of uh, initiatives uh, that we can see that is uh, has been started uh, in the last years one is the, called the Integration Pact in the city of Stockholm, uh, where 350 not only companies but also NGOs and different organizations are collaborating, and it's run by the city of Stockholm, and it's uh, has been quite successful in what they're accomplishing now. Uh, it's a lot about learning and networking, and. Uh, and then there is what we call the language developing jobs. It's about uh, supporting male abuse to language developing jobs. And then there was another example. One of the big Swedish bank, they had a project uh, where they had it for all over the whole Sweden. And they have initiatives locally where they just had physical events where uh, refugees and immigrants came and just met the people working in the bank and just got just a connection and that is shown was talked a lot about as a very very good example because uh, the result of that project reached out that 70 percent of those who were attending and going to these meetings they got a job so that's uh, how we say it's a uh, it's very good example how how that bank worked with that and we are now trying to finalizing our report, which is um, going to be uh, soon ready in our result, what we have been doing. And uh, there is a will from the participating partners in this project or in this that we should also start uh, having a continuation of meeting with uh, these different stakeholders to continue the discussion and how to, to, to collaborate more. 
you, so yeah, that's we just that's have one more meeting right. yeah that's that's the end slide from us okay okay great great well and i hope that you feel better these days uh, i know that you have been struggling with the uh, cold so yes yeah, i hope that you are getting better yes okay. yeah well it was a beautiful practice actually the sort of stages that you are experiencing in, in Sweden uh, on teaching uh, would be a different kind of shortages in other countries, you know? So your practice is very extrapolable to other, um, to other areas and other territories perhaps, and the, the procedure is, uh, well, uh, it could be a, a seed for, for a more uh, broader project perhaps mm. across across Europe uh, and other territories could have all the different needs in particular in Spain. I know that the shortages are not in teaching but are in other areas that must be covered in the in the short term. So it's mm. a, a very nice practice we would like to learn from uh, in that. Okay. If, if I could just add, um, yeah. in the report, uh, we will actually have some interviews with uh, different stakeholders, but also uh, an interview with a student who just uh, went through uh, this, um, this uh, program uh, of the Foreign Te Teachers Building Program, and she is sharing her journey coming as a as a migrant to Sweden and trying to to get on board the the Swedish uh, universe uh, university system and all the struggling and hindrances and so on and now she is a um, a, a teacher who is is working in, in the Swedish school so so it's quite nice speaking of of sharing uh, experiences to to follow her journey through this uh, interview thank you okay great great Thank you very much, both. And well, let's uh, go to move to the next speaker. Oh, there's a question actually online. Uh, Alejandro, uh, do you want to make a comment or a question? Um, could, you, could you hear me? Okay, but uh, right now it's better. Yeah, now much mm -hmm. better. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, technical problem. Um, just a, a little question uh, I, about this extraordinary, extraordinary experience in Stockholm University. But uh, I was in Stockholm uh, some weeks ago for a for a course with my girlfriend. Uh, because uh, we have uh, uh, a scholarship, uh, institute, uh, Swedish Institute scholarship, and uh, we we were there in order to uh, go to the course and check check the housing market, because uh, that experience is uh, very hard. My question is this: if uh, the housing market is so tough, it's so difficult for an international student as, a, as myself. And uh, that problem of uh, the problem of housing and uh, another linked problem, economic problem, uh, are so difficult. Then how is possible to help the situation of refugees and migrants in a uh, uh, city as Scotland, which is uh, so hostile with the uh, foreigners, with the uh, uh, people uh, who has not uh, complete resources in order to face that housing <coughs> market and uh, all the situations which are linked with that. I, I think it's a it's that the effort is obviously uh, very important. It's an effort. But the, the reality of the market in Stockholm is harder than our efforts since a university as, univers as the University of Stockholm. That's my uh, humble opinion after a, a very annoying experience there. And, um, and uh, I'm sure that the professor 
knows exactly what I'm talking about. And um, I don't know, maybe it's uh, too far, my, my intervention about it, but I would like to, to, to listen. What is your opinion about that uh, material problem, material obstacle? Uh, thank you very much. Um, Ivar, yes, I mean, it's, 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 it, you're right. It's, it's a big problem in Stockholm. I mean, for all students to come to Stockholm to, to study, it's, it's a really, really, really big problem. For, for immigrants in the students, I don't know exactly how it works, but I think it's, it's also something that's to do with uh, how they will get apartments or housing. That's also something that is supported by the city and, and the states. It's something that is, but for students, if you come as a student, uh, it's, it's, it's really hard. It's, it's, it's a difficult topic and it's an ongoing discussion. And, and uh, it's, they are building student housing and they are trying to solve it in different ways. And, and it, it's, uh, Stockholm is, is in that sense very problematic because it's a lot yes. of, a lot um... of Actually, Stockholm is a nightmare when it comes to housing for for uh, for uh, for youth growing up here as well. Uh, a lot of young people cannot leave home until they are like 30, 35 or um, their only possibility to get housing is actually to move from Stockholm. And I think that this is a problem that you recognize in, in many big cities in the world today that uh, housing is, is a really, really huge problem. And we see it, for instance, in our Erasmus program, where uh, the university um, receiving students uh, sh should make a promise to, to uh, get housing for the students, but we do not always manage that even in Stockholm. Um, a problem that we are sharing with uh, with uh, Paris and uh, a lot of other uh, other big cities. Um, so it's um, uh, thank you, Alejandro, for for raising this uh, problem because I think it's something that we are sharing. And um, in reality, we we want to uh, provide housing and we want to provide good conditions for for students being migrants or refugees or not but in reality uh, we are not there yet so it's uh, it's really something that we need to discuss together and and see because if we don't solve that then uh, the students cannot come to us so it's a it's a huge problem thank you i can just mention that for for the universities out in the countryside it's a uh... Of course, they have easier to 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 arrange this in. Uh, but for Stockholm and uh, the big university cities, as Lund and, uh, for example, there is a it's a it's a big problem. Yeah, it's probably a problem for many large cities in in mm. you know, not only in Stockholm in Madrid, mm. happens similarly. Okay, we have to work hard I guess, <laughs> to solve the issue. Anyway, thank you, Alejandro, for the question, and thank you, Ivar and Anna again. Uh, let's move on. We are running out of time, unfortunately, so I'll ask the next speakers to be brief. If you could make your presentation in five minutes, that would be great. Uh, our next speaker would be Maria Yakovu from Athens University. Maria, I can see you online. Please go ahead when you're ready. course and I will be very brief because yeah. time runs and I have a medical appointment at two o'clock Greek okay. time yeah, so yeah, I have yeah. to leave exactly yeah but, well, five uh, minutes I would like I and Marlon and I would like to present and to share with you all our experience with the open day that's something that uh, completed our uh, project uh, approach uh, till the next time we since the next time we met in Athens and uh, this is a perspective the part of the NKUA in the whole project of the Civis Alliance. So I would like just to remember the main points of our objectives. The, more or less, we had the same um, uh, point of view and the same stance towards uh, understanding, developing an overview of uh, our population, student population with migrant and refugee background. 
And in this point, we would like to add something that is peculiar, specific in uh, Greek societies. I mean, Greek repatriate immigrants whose families left countries for various reasons during civil war and uh, economic reasons. And of course, now they belong to the Greek diaspora. And we have movements from outside Greece and in Greece. And this is something very important that we added in our projects because in this population, we found not only students, but also members of their families and members of the academic staff who were willing to prepare to present their own stories, their life stories about these uh, migratory roads. And finally, as all people here already said, we wanted just to grasp the momentum because now a new population, an emerging student population is coming with refugee background from Ukraine. And of course, Greece is included in the countries who are host countries for this um, population also. And I would like just to remind you the main steps, the roadmap we followed during all this experience the previous month. And of course, this small box on the bottom with the red letters is uh, the open day that the big event that we wanted to organize in order to share all this experience, all different voices, to bring together all different voices of students we found during all this uh, trajectory. I mean, the different focus group that preceded, and of course, our own personal research about the legislation and uh, the policies ap uh, applied by our university in relation to students with uh, migrant and refugee backgrounds. So I would like just to present to the identity of our open day uh, event that finally was not just an open day, um, how to say, session with uh, talks and uh, everything, but it was an open workshop organized by two teams of um, the Alliance, I mean the Open Labs, Marlen and Tai, and the Task Force of Civic Engagement, Filia Isari, our colleague from the Department of Psychology. And of course, during this day, we would like to explore the presence and experience of all our students and alumni with an immigrant or intercultural background and a new population emerging in our university with this international profile coming from Far East, for example, Chinese students who during their study abroad attend courses in um, the Greek university, in the University of Athens. And um, in this event, we had some two uh, very interesting and stimulating talks about the presence of foreigners in general within the Greek educational system. I mean, in the formal education system of primary and secondary education as an historical review of the last 50 years, because here we reach in some very uh, interesting conclusions about the presence of this population within the educational system. I mean, before, and after the university, before entering in the university and while uh, attending courses in the university and presenting all their life stories. And of course, we had some round tables with students, alumni and graduates, not only uh, this people, this population in person, but with their families, because it was really uh, touching to uh, listen to stories of people of ge first generation coming to Greece and preparing their children to attend classes, to be involved, to be integrated inside the Greek educational system. And as I told you before, something that was really interesting and we found in the way of all this project was the other side. I mean, not only um, students, but also uh, academic staff who could share this migratory uh, trajectory with uh, the whole group. So the conclusion, and if you want the um, something that came out from all this experience for us, is that we found a very big distinctive line between the educational system in Greece before the university, so the support provided to all this population before being registered in the university and the situation in the university. There was a kind of ambivalence, if you want, because uh, the system 
could not support so tightly uh, pupils in their my migratory uh, life before. I mean that they felt a little bit shy, if you want, to be open and to present these life stories or to be accepted for the identity they had as migrants. Although in the university they found uh, that uh, it was like a shelter. There were all their stories could be heard and unfolded. This was a main finding for us. And we were really, uh, if you want, surprised to hear this kind of contradiction, that there was an educational system in primary, secondary education where something was really homogeneous and cannot support in this way the presence of migrant uh, pupils. And in contrary, the university deliberated their voices and gave to them a um, place where they could uh, provide all these differences, all these, um, if you want, uh, different voices and multiple identities. And of course, during this workshop, we had the presence, if you want, of these new foreigners, as we call them, students from Chinese during their study abroad, as I told you before. And something that was really interesting now, because it's a, a coincidence, if you want, that this talk now is delivered in the same time that a new law is being passed in Greek parliament about uh, the academic system that restricts many rights, if you want, on the public academic education, because all our students there stress the point that they felt really proud of being part of a system very protective and very, if uh, you want, um, a, a system that gave them to, the opportunity to study with free textbooks, with um, the rights of finding house, medical care, to have access to libraries, to learn the language, the language in low cost, uh, inside the language teaching center located in the university. And this was the suggestion just to protect this public character of uh, the Greek academic system. So I think Mad Marlin and I, we are really touched now that in this moment, a new legislation is coming in Greece. And the same moment we present all these findings from uh, the open day. Um, family, the, the main point to be raised is that uh, finally university was considered by them as home, as family, the place where they deliberate uh, their voices and inspired them to present their migratory stories and all these different uh, voices inside their academic uh, life. So what is to be done from us till the next, till the end of the project? Uh, from all these experiences, we are on the way to product a short documentary and everything will, I already sent you a brief short version of this video that is based on the open day session, but we are going to extend it with more uh, data and of course subtitling for uh, uh, English uh, speaking uh, uh, version and um, all things pro uh, drawn from the focus groups will be transcribed and processed. So we are going to prepare a handbook with all this data coming from different uh, research levels. And this is something if you want very important for our university because we're going to have to have for the first time a database with all this information, not only in uh, qualitative, but in quantitative, but also in qualitative way, how the academic, the university stands for all these people with uh, different origin and different life stories uh, before coming here. This is the end of my presentation. I think uh, I run a lot. Ah, I have we had in the end something that we like a lot. It's a new mural in the facade of the building of the Philosophical uh, School of Philosophy. And uh, we would like to share it with you because as uh, uh, Jose Luis, you, you showed us the mural in uh, Spain is something that we feel really proud because it's a new ornament for uh, our school. 
Thank you, Marlon, the, the, the floor is yours if you want to add something in all yeah. this. Oh, you said everything so well, Maria. Uh, it's a pleasure to be in this team and do things together. Uh, I don't have anything to add, just uh, to be here if there are questions. Okay, great, Marlene. Um, I'm glad to say you hello, actually. <laughs> Well, uh, well, thank you for sharing the mural, Maria. It's uh, beautiful, actually. And sharing your point about how the universities are a safe environment for migrants, and they feel uh, like more uh, keen to uh, share their experiences. And, and it's clearly an example, I think, in all the institutions. And that's, uh, well, one of our jobs that that. Uh, Safety reaches other parts of our society. You know, we have to translate this uh, kind of comfort to other areas. And let's say so it's um, part of the Just job we need to work. One yeah. thing to yeah. add um, uh, as a, an extension to what Maria um, uh, pointed out before, uh, sometimes uh, uh, qualitative research that focuses on the life stories of few individuals might be um, prone to, um, not to criticism, but uh, to skepticism, how extended is this um, um, uh, impact, the impact of the university in people's lives. Uh, of course, we it, it's just um, some uh, life stories, but they're very indicative and they are making the point of the university even stronger that uh, it, it's not only a place where you can get an, a, a certificate, but a, a formative uh, environment for your life. And um, within this, uh, public uh, sphere of, um, of um, uh, offering resources and uh, supporting, empowering the disempowered in a way of the society, those ones that do not have the means to um, uh, um, continue their studies in private education perhaps, is extremely important and very important to safeguard in, in society. And that was something, as Maria said, um, that was very striking in all the um, uh, life stories that uh, were shared with us. And perhaps that was also one of the reasons uh, the, the, the parents of, uh, of the students were so willing to be part of that open day uh, in order to make a tribute to, to this life-changing experience for their children through a public university. Yeah, okay. Yes, and I think that we should stress, uh, as Marlon said, the public uh, character of uh, the Greek universities. So that's something that is going to miss in the next, in the following years. And uh, I think that this is a point that we should raise during our project. All right. Well, thank you both. Uh, Maria, you are free to leave now. <laughs> so you're allowed to leave yes. and continue Apologies your duties. Apologies for yeah. leaving the meeting now. OK, let's move on to our next speaker that uh, I skipped, actually, before. It's Etienne Dauphin <laughs> from University Libre de Brussels. And he's going to talk us also about the experience in Nepal. Thank you, Jose. Uh, I'll try to be very quick. Well, uh, I will give you a very quick presentation of our uh, current uh, state of development of our own uh, initiative in Brussels uh, into the frame of the transitional action. Um, as a short reminder, we, we, decide, we, we reframe the different initiatives into the transnational action and three different kinds of, of uh, contribution. Uh, those that will participate into a kind of diagnostic, local or, or transitional diagnostic uh, of, the, of the different topics uh, um, within this, this uh, general uh, theme on, of migration. Some other contribution would, would be into uh, uh, another, um, would be uh, there to, to raise some awareness, to share stories about uh, uh, particular um, events. And some other would be dedicated to uh, uh, action, so to document and disseminate some uh, um, interesting um, uh, activities that are that have been already done. That is where uh, our, our um, contribution from Brussels is. It's about uh, disseminating and documenting. 
Um, we are, we've been, um, we have selected uh, uh, an association, a student association in, in Brussels uh, that involves students engaged in the law curriculum. Um, their goal is to inform asylum seekers about the administrative and legal path that they, they're going to, uh, to be confronted to. Um, and the, the, we, we thought that it was very interesting um, for, for its acti action uh, as a whole, but also uh, uh, as it, it was titling to the values that, uh, are, that CIVIS uh, tries to promote, uh, having a territorial impact to promote civic engagement service learning of the, of the students, and to show uh, uh, an interesting inter-transdisciplinary approach. Um, and our, our goal here to share good practices of this association in terms of response to the migration issue. Um, and so why did we choose Law Student with Refugee? I've already given you some, some ideas in terms of, of the city's uh, um, values. But we also wanted uh, several stuff. We wanted to recognize the involvement of the students, their skills and their knowledge um, to give them some kind of extracurricular acknowledgement. It's not uh, this association is, is been, has been active for several years and has achieved very important stuff. So that was a very important idea to uh, give some retribution um, uh, to, to their involvement. Uh, also to help this association strengthen and enhance their action, uh, the documentation is how to do their kind of activity would allow them uh, to find some financial support, uh, for instance, and also to disseminate their model through the CIVIS Alliance. We can think about similar association within the network of of cities to share cases, bring out transversal and systemic issues that has been raised through the activities of the students. Um, and how are we go going to, how are we documenting the, the, their work? Uh, we've, um, we've, uh, we've done a venue documentary uh, within uh, a collaboration with a very engaged, lively and authentic narration working with the uh, uh, first move uh, st uh, production studio. Um, then we are the, the four, four members of this uh, association are uh, engaged to writing a comprehensive documentation uh, of, their, of their work, the mission, the institutional framework, the background, the working methodologies, the valorization in curriculum, the achievement, and etc. Many. Uh, important stuff to really describe and, and, and show what's going on in this association. And we have a first that, that is expected by mid-August. They would like to have a final version translated and with a, uh, a, 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 a good um, layout to be uh, published and, and disseminated within CIVIS network and, 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 and beyond the network um, by mid or at end of September. And then we will uh, have a video documentary premiere uh, during the, the month of September that will be organized with the, the student of the association. And that will be the occasion to have a, some kind of debate or one round table around um, the topic that the, the, this association is facing with their collaborator, with their other stakeholders on the field. Um, that, that's all for me, and I will finish with a short one minute teaser of the video documentary. Oh. There's no sound there. I'm not sure it will transfer onto the, the hybrid. I'm not sharing that. Ah, do you know who can do that? Yes, you, 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 but let me share your presentation and we will share mm -hmm. and, uh, and if you, yeah, share if you close it. If I close it, yeah. And let me share. If you can do that for me. I have some technical stuff to adjust there. So, 
Right, so I'm going to try and I'll try and do it from my screen. Okay. Let's try. Thank you so much for your patience with me. I really appreciate it. <laughs> That's that's all for me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Well, let's talk now. Uh, Pinar Aksu, who is a PhD scholar here. Uh, like to the next call, Willa. And she's conducting a, a thesis work entitled Art and Justice Using Art Based Practices for Social Change. Um, thank you so much. I'll see if the presentation works. Um, yeah, so my name is Naraksu and um, I'm a first, just finishing my first year. Um, yes, perfect. Uh, just finishing my first year um, in, in PhD with the UNESCO RIMA. Um, and I'm also Human Rights and Advocacy Coordinator at Maryhill Integration Network, is, which is one of the um, welcoming spaces uh, in, in Glasgow. Um, as, as mentioned, uh, I'm looking at art and law in migration, um, especially how art practices could be used for social change and access to justice in migration, what this could mean. Um, and I'm with the School of Education with Alison Phipps and with the School of Law um, with Maria Fletcher. I guess today I want to talk more about um, the context of migration and the, the, the support groups that exist in, in Glasgow and also briefly talk about the ongoing issues that people are facing um, and how possibly we can use research and the participation of people um, who are the subjects of, of research as well. Just a very quick history. So in terms of migration uh, within uh, Glasgow and Scotland, um, I would say that the, the support networks and integration networks started in the early 2000s. That's when people were dispersed into city uh, from various countries. Um, so usually in, in, in the UK, people get sent to Glasgow um, initially um, when they arrive to the country and the process is called the dispersal uh, process. Um, and since then, there has been many integration networks and support groups that was formed in the city. Uh, the key one being the Scottish Refugee Council um, and then Medical Integration Network. And then there was other kind of support groups, campaigns and um, solidarity groups. 
and integration networks formed as well. One of the key areas is around 2014, um, due to lack of funding from the government, the integration networks, um, there was a lot of integration networks across the city. However, they decided to cut the integration networks and uh, join them up according to the area. Uh, so, for example, the one in Mary Hill still exists, but the, the ones in other areas of the city uh, had to be stopped, and a few of them are uh, at the moment in existence. In terms of uh, briefly about uh, MIN, as we call it, so it's a, it's a space that was created in 2001 uh, by Rema and many other volunteers who herself came from Kosovo. Uh, from, um, as we know, from the 1990s um, uh, um, tragedy. And um, so it's, it's a space at the moment where it welcomes people, specifically working with people who are in the asylum process, people who has refugee status and the local community as well. I guess one of the things that when we were talking about the new Scots strategy and also talking about how we involve people when making decisions is valuing and the experiences that, that people have and that people bring, which I think is one of the key areas for me especially, is looking at the questions around how do we involve people with lived experience in the decision-making process. And because we are talking about strategies and integration methods, but how do we make, make sure that people's voices are at the center so that they are also in the decision-making process. Uh, because people do come here with skills and people are, as we heard from many others um, as well, do have qualifications. And in some cases, there are researchers amongst the people who travel. So how do we create a platform that enables uh, and provides opportunity for people as well? So that's one of the areas that I work on and I'm really interested in and uh, to find how this could be further developed as well. In terms of just a very brief history of what is going on in the in Glasgow and in Scot in Scotland and UK generally? Um, I'm not going to touch uh, a lot on the hotel accommodation as Savan earlier talked about it. Um, so when people usually arrive, they arrive uh, in in England, um, and the the or the mechanism that manages everything is called the Home Office, as we as we all know. Um, and usually people are provided with housing and this housing is a private managed by a private uh, contractor uh, proposed by the Home Office. So it used to be called CERCO, G4S, and now it's called Mears, who's managing the housing, the accommodation for people. People can also experience detention as well, um, as the government calls it, the immigration removal centers. Uh, there are at the moment more than 11 detentions um, across the country in the UK and one detention in Scotland called Dungeval uh, Immigration Removal Centre. There is no limit on detention, so UK is the only international country um, that has no limit on detention. So people, when they are detained, they could be detained for two months or two years or even more than that as well. Uh, I'm going to very briefly focus on the Nationality and Borders Act and also give two case studies about how we can use creativity uh, for making social cha change and also how we can uh, involve universities uh, and how uh, we can make sure that people's voices are at the centre. In terms of during the COVID-19 and the asylum community, one of the key problems that people had experienced was the food poverty, digital poverty, um, as a result of not having enough support uh, given to them. Um, hotel accommodation and detention, as it was touched on earlier. There was also a new space created called Mother and Baby Unit, where uh, it was specifically for women who's in the asylum process, where they were taken from their homes and put into this uh, unit to be accommodated. Um, People also have no recourse to public funds, so having no right to work, which I'm going to touch on briefly. Um, and there was a huge uh, gathering and protest from the image you can see as well, which was uh, which is a practice called don rate in the UK. So when you are in the asylum process, the, the Home Office has the right to uh, come and detain you. 
and the practice is called donry because they usually use this practice in the early morning. So they come at around 5 a.m. or 6 a.m. to take you away from your home into a detention center then to remove you out of the country. So there was a huge solidarity that took place uh, last year where two people were trying uh, to be detained and the whole community came along and to stop this, um, to stop this practice. I guess with the Nationality and Borders Act, the key areas that it's going to create for welcoming people and it's going to be an extreme barrier for, uh, for legislations and policies around integration is going to be the creation of offshore asylum processing centers. I'm sure everybody must have seen the news about Rwanda and what's being discussed there. So that is still on the table. That's when people arrive to the country, instead of being dispersed into the communities across the city, they would be sent to Rwanda while their asylum cases are being processed. And one of the tricky aspects of this new policy is that people will stay there once their asylum cases have been processed. So rather than being sent back to uh, the country to the UK, they would be staying um, in Rwanda, which is a huge problem for academics and for NGOs and for everyone, because that would mean that we have no people that we are wel welcoming in our communities and we have no projects that we would be doing <laughs> and we would, there would be no uh, support mechanisms uh, for the people. Um, as you can see, these are the other areas that the Nationality and Borders Act is going to uh, restrain people, people's rights, uh, as, as, which is now part of the law, which was passed at the end of June. Um, I guess how these, uh, how this, how the law strengthens border control is, it's a violation to international protection and law. And one of the, uh, one of the areas that the UK government is trying to do at the moment to make this possible is they are trying to withdraw themselves from the human rights, um, human rights. Um, law and from the Human Rights Act, and they're trying to introduce the Bill of Rights. Um, and they're even removing the human from the, uh, from the title of the new bill and making it the Bill of Rights. Um, it's a direct threat to human rights of people seeking an asylum and refuge, um, as we've heard from the other speakers as well. The language used by the media is really crucial at the moment, and the term they have keep using is called illegal. They keep saying that people, these people are illegal. They are coming in illegal routes. And because they are using that in a repeated mechanism and way, the, the general society and the general public are understanding and agreeing, uh, being pulled towards uh, in agreement with, with the government, unfortunately. And also they are, the, 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 new, the new law is criminalizing movement. So it's criminalizing migration. Um, and they are doing this by making as part of the law, um, which in itself could be quite terrifying. <laughs> um, and, and that's why at the moment we rely a lot on the, um, on the lawyers who has been uh, working to stop the flights to Rwanda and who, have, who are uh, doing the case work with the people. Um, I just want to show two very brief cases that um, that we have been doing at uh, at my workplace, but also, and now it's uh, it's a it has been uh, discussed at different platforms um, uh, within the academia and within different workplaces, which is the right to work. So in the in the UK, when people arrive here, if they are seeking asylum, they are banned from working, and um, they can apply to right to work after one year, but they will be uh, they can only apply to work within the shortage occupation list. And the shortage occupation list is very rare jobs, such as like astronauts. <laughs> and yeah, that's why it's called the shortage occupation list. Um, although recently they've changed to include nurses and social workers as well, which is a good step uh, for some people who have that skills. Um, and unfortunately, people who are teachers, chefs, artists, and many more um, are banned from uh, working. And one of the key areas that we are asking and we are wanting various groups and various platforms uh, of people to understand is the importance of right to work and how right to work is a fundamental human right. If people are provided with right to work, how it would contribute towards <coughs> integration, how it would contribute towards people's language skills, and how 
it will contribute for people to be welcomed and feel part of our community. Um, and it's, it's amazing that um, we did host an event at the Glasgow University a few years ago before I started my studying uh, about the importance of providing um, right to work. The other area, which again, the other speakers also mentioned, and I'm really glad to see that it's, it's an area that um, it's a common um, aspect for welcoming people is the education aspect of it. Um, so when people are in the asylum process, in, in here in the UK, they can only go to college to study part-time courses. And if they want to apply to university, um, they would be treated as an international student. So they would be expected to pay thousands of pounds. So at least starting from 15,000. Uh, and that's just not going to be possible for somebody who's in the asylum process. Um, so at the moment, we are trying to gather some uh, data and um, we're doing a survey to understand how many people this is impacting uh, in Scotland and what we can do. Um, we know that the universities in, in the UK, there is universities are called the University of Sanctuaries. So some universities provide scholarships uh, to people. Um, I know that Glasgow University is one of them where they are uh, providing scholarships for an uh, X number of people. But when we wanted to campaign on this issue, we wanted to make sure that it's changed for everyone um, and that we appreciate, you know, the universities are trying to um, engage with the people by providing scholarships to, let's say, 10 people, but what about 100 people who are not able to go to uh, university? So this is, a, this is another area that um, we are really interested um, in. And just this year, um, at the UNESCO Raila, uh, Raila Spring School, we had people who are um, who were lawyers and teachers coming along to the event and carrying out the presentation about the importance of right to work and access to education, which I think was a really powerful tool for people to feel that they can make change and they can actually be in on, at these platforms to raise their uh, voices. Um, one minute left, yes, to finish on a positive note, <laughs> Um, and to highlight how we can use people's voices and also the research and uh, direct experience as the campaign we did with the right to vote, uh, which was supported by um, many organizations, um, uh, was to provide right to vote for people who are in the refugee, people who has refugee status. Um, so eventually with the Scottish Election, Elections Act uh, that came into place in 2020, uh, people with refugee status can now vote in local elections in, in Scotland. Um, again, a huge achievement for people to be to feel that they are welcome in a community, to feel that their voices can be heard, and to feel that they have the opportunity to directly make um, change and also participate in democracy. Um, although the, the second amendment that we were hoping which to be passed was for the for people in the asylum process to have the right to vote as well, um, which was, um, it, it didn't pass through, um, but hopefully that would be an area um, that we're going to explore. So just to finish, um, maybe just to mention that it's really important when we are making the strategies and when we're talking about the policy of welcoming people to make sure that there are mechanisms that people's voices are at the center, because at the end of the day, we are the policies and the laws or the strategies that we're talking about for welcoming people is directly going to impact their lives and it's going to be impacted on the government level as well. So making sure that there are uh, mechanisms and tools and methodologies that we use in the research so that they have the, people have the um, ownership of the data that is being produced. And um, I think it's really important and also to do this in a creative way and do, the, the example you show about the documentary was really powerful because that's one way of um, showing how people could uh, participate in this. I'll stop here because I'm told I need to stop, but I could talk more, but I'm not going to. So thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks a lot. I think there will be time uh, during lunch uh, to have a further discussion with you and and your, your points. Uh, I think you made that 
in a very nice overview of the situation that is going on here. So uh, there, I'm sure that there will be questions and reflections on that uh, during lunch. Okay, we had a planned uh, recording for the next speaker, but I'm not sure if we could leave it for, what do you prefer? Uh, we can go ahead with the schedule. Uh, if it, uh, how long is the uh, recording more? Eight minutes. Eight minutes. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. Will we make it shorter, perhaps? Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay, okay. Uh, so then our next speaker should be from uh, La Sapienza, University of Rome, Daniela Di Leo. I don't know. No, she's not connected. No? Okay. So, all right. So then, I think the next person should be Stefan Lang from. Salzburg University. Stefan, are you around? Yes, I am there. You connected? I'm connected. I'm physically here, and you should see my screen. Is that right? Uh, not yet, but probably in a minute. Yeah, right now. OK, so Perfect. welcome, everybody, or good afternoon. My name is Stefan Lang. I'm here from the University of Salzburg. Um, I'm representing a laboratory on geo-humanitarian action. And there is also next to me, I don't know if you see her, but later on, because I don't know if the focus works or not, um, Eva Steinbacher. I think you have to come a bit closer okay. because um, the camera is otherwise not working. So she is the deputy coordinator of our Ideas Lab, and the Ideas Lab is our open lab contribution um, to CVs. So, and I'm also representing here, if you see on the slide here, a little, another logo, which is a private institute um, that is uh, acting as a regional multiplier and stimulating the uptake of geospatial technologies in local and regional administration. Yeah, so I think that this kind of combination is, is ideal to the topic what we talk today. So the title is From Global Concern to Local Humanitarian Action. So obviously, I mean, I don't have to tell you that, um, of course, there is several dimensions of humanitarian crisis. Um, and we believe that all of them, of course, they, they um, are inherently spatial. So we branded this term of geo-humanitarian action. So it's not something, something only that we uh, convey to our students in terms of awareness of what's going on, but also to enable them to get into action, yeah, to use geospatial technology to actually help um, and engage with NGOs and other organizations which are active in the humanitarian field um, to, really, to really support their, their endeavors. Um, and this is a little bit what we try to share here. So we have our uh, intensive, like more than 10 years, uh, intensive partnership with Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders, um, and not just like a collaboration, but it's actually a, a research R&D partnership because we have a a huge, a large-scale project together with them that uh, partly is financed by our by public means, by our ministry, um, but at the other half is actually coming from MSF directly. So they are actually funding our um, research. Um, and so the, the, the general question, of course, in humanitarian crisis is about population. Who is affected? Where are the people? Um, which new settlements emerge, so what does it mean? Is it uh, due to um, uh, forced displacement or has it any other meaning? But obviously if something is popping up quite quickly, we, we, we know that this is usually not done uh, just uh, by chance. So um, if you of course see the impact of um, natural disasters as we call it, so they all have of course a social impact. Yeah, the, Two, 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 two images from flood and earthquake event. Um, but of course, there is also conflicts that then lead to the conversion of, um, and it's not always as obvious as here, but to the emergence of, of huge, set, huge settlement, new settlements and refugee camps here, like in the northern Uganda. It's quite interesting because Uganda as such is, um, is a country, I think, with one of the most uh, friendly um, refugee welcoming uh, attitudes, but it was simply overwhelmed by the influx of South Sudanese um, refugees over the last year. So they also, of course, started to, um, 
to come up with these, these refugee camps. So um, it's about mapping, basically trying to identify the presence of population of displaced population also coming up with quite concrete numbers. So we have this collaboration, as I said, with MSF um, in their daily routines. So this is actually done by a company, which I'm just um, explaining in a second. Um, so it's about how to find out actually where are the people in need, what's the composition of the population, uh, which is affected and um, also the um, sort of dynamics in that within the course of the year or, or within a, a longer time period. Um, and there is other uh, integrated assessments that we are actually doing um, more long term in terms of malaria risk assessment or urban sanitation, something where we integrate different geospatial indicators. So we heavily use this so-called ideas lab for that, um, which is actually a kind of um, merger of four different labs. So we have open science lab, research lab, edu lab, and transfer lab. And um, so in, in one second, actually, we will later on explain a little bit more about this, how we use it also for um, dissemination education purposes for school kids and the general public. But this again um, brings me back to the collaboration with private companies. So we have a spin-off company um, of the University of Salzburg, which is also, of course, located not far away. Um, but they're actually providing these sort of operational services uh, on a weekly basis to MSF. So there's really um, a, a tight connection where we in our geo-humanitarian lab, we are uh, working on new technologies. And then, of course, there is a transfer of these technologies um, towards the companies and towards the NGOs directly. Um, engaging the public. Um, so this is one step ahead. And we show you a few pictures. So Missing Maps is an initiative that you may have heard of. Um, so it's a collaboration between Red Cross, um, Doctors Without Borders, um, and some others, where you can actually involve citizens, students, pupils, whosoever has access in his uh, back home, actually, um, to, to the internet can actively contribute to that. And maybe here I can quickly hand over to my colleague. Yes, so um, I'm working in the Ideas Lab, as Stefan mentioned, and we are kind of the outreach lab, uh, also for the scientific work that is done here, and of course also the humanitarian uh, pillar, which is quite strong also in our work. Uh, we are also in having contact with the spin-off company to get results or inputs from them also on their work, which we then include into the workshops that we lead, for example, uh, with a focus on, on students and pupils uh, of different age range. So you can see here, this ranges from elementary school, basically, um, up to high school students or also even the students at the university. Uh, we also do uh, Mapatons, as you see on the uh, left hand side, uh, where we are connecting to this uh, missing maps approach to gather information which is not presently there already in existing maps and to provide this to NGOs for the work done also later on. And um, everything that you can see here is done quite regularly that we have these school classes here. And it's uh, a great opportunity to really pick up. Um, a result uh, from research also and transport it to pupils or to interest the public. So we also quite often have visits from adults here, from different target groups, also even politicians, um, where we can present what we have at the facilities. Yeah, and this usually happens during the day and during the night. So this is our last slide, some takeaway messages, some lessons learned that we achieved uh, over the last years. So updating geospatial reference information to eliminate white spots. So this is these mapping activities that we're doing. Uh, the white spots, obviously, not only on the maps, but also in our brains, because this generates awareness. Um, and of course, we know that conflicts now over the last year <laughs> come closer. Um, it's not just happening in Africa, elsewhere in the world. Uh, but it's really coming closer and it's, it's very good, I think, uh, and very important to familiarize with the, with the topic of conflicts, not see, to just see this as something distant that happens somewhere, but it's actually something that, that affects our daily life. 
Um, the, the act of co-creating maps, I think, is also changing the attitude towards the situation. So you're familiarized with the situation. You see from a spatial perspective, which, of course, is a bit a little bit more objective. Some could say it's more technocratic, maybe, or technologic. But on the other hand, of course, um, you would develop a better understanding um, and you can actually, the spatial view can actually support to have a more integrated representation, a more integrated understanding of even complex realities. So thanks a lot. That's all from our side. Thank you very much, uh, both. Uh, I think it has been a very nice presentation and that introduces also the component of new technologies and the application to, to this field, which is a very interesting approach uh, that uh, perhaps could uh, find uh, some synergies also in, in other institutions in the future. And considering that phase uh, two of cities is going to be uh, the, the also uh, an important uh, point of um, in the trajectory of, uh, of the Salzburg University, and the integration of CVs uh, can can happen also uh, in these kind of areas uh, where where the open labs must have to say. So uh, thank you, thank you for your uh, in, for your presentation and your input that could be very valuable in the future. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so I think uh, we should uh, end up. The today's presentations with the contribution of University of Marseille with Valerie Caravel, who's going to present uh, their activities uh, in the project. So please, Valerie. Thanks a lot, uh, Jose Luis. Yes, uh, in uh, at Marseille University in the Open Lab, we have done a, a sort of a different choice as we we try to. Um, we, we chose to, to, to try to uh, sort of lay uh, some bricks for our transnational uh, uh, actions uh, within our uh, civics network of uh, open labs. Um, the actions we, we uh, address not uh, directly to this, not only directly to, to, to this uh, transnational initiative, on migrants and refugees, but also it aims to uh, spread on all the projects within uh, each of our open lands. Uh, the first, the first uh, action was a training uh, we had uh, to enhance the, the sense of, uh, of uh, um, understanding of what, how was um, the the process of discrimination, racism, and, and uh, anti-Semitism uh, within uh, uh, during the Second World War, and we had a training at the the Candemil. Uh, the Candemil uh, is, as um, most of you know, a, a camp which was an internment camp, then transit camp, Jewish deportation camp, and then really, at first it was a tile brick uh, factory and re it re, uh, became a, um, a factory and then they stopped and they wanted to uh, mention how it was important to, uh, to have this memorial, this site as a memorial and the UNESCO chair was created in 2013. So the objective was to not to forget uh, that uh, even if uh, we have fight for rights and freedom. Uh, it's never known and wrong, sorry, uh, but we have to be aware uh, that it doesn't uh, occur uh, once more. So uh, this training was uh, guided to, to just understand how the persons in that camp uh, lived, in what conditions, and then to define together uh, what is discrimination, what is uh, racism, and how this process happened. Uh, and of course, to prevent it to reappear again. So uh, the, we've done uh, that, uh, as I said, to, to have a sort of a certification uh, uh, scheme 
uh, labeling of the, the projects uh, we ran in uh, our open labs, some of them that uh, could be run and could be supported by the, this uh, certification scheme, certification process. Uh, and uh, it, it's why we've done that training with uh, other uh, coordinators of uh, the open labs last uh, January. But um, now the next steps, of course, is to uh, labelize our, some of our projects. In uh, Ex Marseille University, we are going to do it with the uh, Herbel uh, project. Herbel is a very sensitive neighborhood uh, in uh, Marseille with a lot of uh, immigrants. And unfortunately, well known as uh, uh, an area with a, a lot of uh, drug traffic trafficking. So uh, it's important to, um, to work with the inhabitant to uh, be aware that this, this uh, airbell uh, area was also an area where there were a lot of artists uh, fleeing from the, the Nazism, uh, um, during the, the war and uh, they want to also uh, um, make people be aware of what happened and, and do sort of a museum and activities within the, the, this neighborhood. Uh, most of the activities have been uh, during last uh, spring and uh, we are going to labelize all the, the process uh, with, uh, with that uh, that team associations inhabitants of this uh, neighborhood. That's the, the first step of uh, our action. And the second uh, action is uh, one I'm going to, to leave uh, Claude Emmanuel uh, Triomphe explain to you the second uh, activity we have to within our network of uh, open labs. Claude Emmanuel, are you online? We can hear you, Claude Emmanuel. I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, we can. Okay. The okay. Is okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Valerie. Uh, so I'm the, the president of an NGO dealing with uh, developing uh, citizens' responsibility at local, national, and transnational levels. And we are member of the uh, CVS uh, Open Lab in uh, Marseille University. Um, I just want to say that um, we, I, I have no time and you are tired after all those uh, presentations. Uh, so I will go directly to the point, what we have done um, with you. Why with you? Because uh, I took the floor uh, when you were meeting at the Candy Mill uh, to present a seminar about civic engagement in Marseille. And this seminar uh, took place uh, last 10 and 11th of June. And uh, we gathered almost uh, 100 youngsters, uh, including uh, 17 students from the Civis Alliance. And uh, it was not only students, but people with different background, a lot with ethnic backgrounds uh, living in Marseille or in the area and some other from other uh, French regions. And what we did was, uh, you know, a two days uh, seminar, but not a classical seminar. Uh, the, the, the two days were divided between the Friday with local challenges. And instead of discussing uh, topics, um, uh, we made uh, groups of five to eight people and all each group, you know, uh, was involved with a local uh, structure, uh, mostly NGOs. 
dealing with um, one very concrete uh, civic action, like uh, helping homeless people, uh, making uh, you know inter cross generational link in um, you know house for elder elder people or making sports with disabled people, etc., 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 and even cooking with and for refugees. And it worked extremely well. You know, and we, there was an enthusiasm uh, across these uh, 100 youngsters. And the, the day after, on the Saturday, they were challenged, you know, at transnational level about the topic of mobility the topic of how uh, can um, we can find you know a way to label uh, you know the, the concept of european capital of culture and we are looking for a concept of european capital of the, of the sea you know and how this concept could be very inclusive and include because the sea is really linked to migrations and uh, when you come to marseille it's obvious and um, and the third challenge was linked to uh, political uh, commitment and engagement of youngsters in in Europe, and um, well, uh, that was this uh, seminar. Um, we sent you or Valerie sent you a, a short questionnaire about the feedback, and we we sent almost the same questionnaire to the students. Unfortunately, we did not get many answers, but may, maybe you can give us some uh, feedback uh, right now. And I would just finish to say that after this seminar, which was the first one we organized in Marseille, we had an ID. And this ID is shared by many local and national and probably European actors is to organize in the future, let's define what is the future, a European and Mediterranean uh, festival of civic engagement. And uh, I will probably uh, develop this concept uh, this afternoon after 2.30, but this concept of European and Mediterranean festival of civic commitment will include a central and key topic on refugees and migra migrations. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Claude Emmanuel. Well, we insist uh, so you can get more answers and more feedback uh, from the attendant. Okay, we'll try to, to insist those that uh, uh, were attending the seminar. All right. Well, I think it's uh, almost time to, to finish. Um, I would like to end up saying that uh, despite all the themes and activities that you have uh, seen today here through the different presentations, there are also some other activities planned that couldn't be presented today because it will happen this week or the next. Um, in particular, uh, La Sapienza, the University of Rome, is planning to have a theater festival that will take place uh, this week, uh, also connecting art with the uh, migratory issues or the uh, migration and, and civic engagement purpose on, and target. Uh, and there will be also activities planned for next week, I think, in Tübingen University. I think Jan is around and want to say a few words on what will happen there. Jan, do you want to introduce those? Um, yes, of course. Thanks a lot for all the interesting presentations. Um, we will have a panel discussion next week in Tübingen inviting um, Ukrainian migrants to speak about their perspectives, um, their experiences. Uh, we will also have high level representatives of the university on the panel um, who can give information about the, the position or the positioning of the university in the Q and Q and war in the Ukraine. Um, 
yeah, we hope to have a good discussion. Um, and I think I wanted to present the approach today, but I think due to um, the other really, really interesting, interesting presentations, we are lacking a little on time. So um, I think that's enough from our side today. Um, I'm looking forward to present the whole initiative, the whole activity when it is yeah, done um, during one of our next meetings. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Jan. We appreciate uh, that. Uh, well, actually, there was um, a plan to have a, like a wrap-up session at the end, but it's too much, I think, for today. I would just say uh, a few words, um, considering all the uh, things that we have seen today, the beautiful work that was presented from the different universities, Especially, I want to uh, thank the people from University of Glasgow who did, did a great job showing up what uh, they, they are doing here, the projects that are taking place, and also the possible connections with the works that we are um, also doing in other universities. I think it's a part of uh, the city's um, uh, message or part of the city's purpose to find uh, common targets in, in the different territories in order to build uh, larger projects in the future and cooperate each other to, to have a broader impact. So I think the, the general uh, open session we have today, I think it has uh, covered most of the, the topics uh, we would like to, to show up. And well, uh, just to say thank you to all of you, those that uh, were attending physically and those online. And we hope to have the chance to have another meeting uh, in the future to also analyze the outputs in, with more perspective and also find the possibility of uh, building uh, more ambitious ideas and, and solutions, okay? So thank you very much and enjoy your afternoon. <laughs>
sponsored by Rehman Jishti MP and UNHCR. And this felt especially poignant to have all these portraits of displaced women in the House of Parliament. In light of the government's failed attempt to deport refugees to Rwanda only the week before, as well as the Nationality and Borders Bill that had been passed earlier this year. Also unveiled at this exhibition were three portraits of female judges from Afghanistan who had been granted sanctuary in the UK, who had been forced to flee when the Taliban seized hold of power. These, unfortunately, it's not, it's not been possible to show any images of these paintings um, according to my promise to the women to, for them to maintain anonymity on the account of the safety of their loved ones still in Afghanistan. What was most moving of all was for the judges and Maria and Nadia to be present at the opening ceremony and to see their responses to the paintings. Tears poured down Nadia's face um, and she said that she simply had no words. During Scottish Refugee Week last year, it was special to have the opportunity to show the paintings at the University of Glasgow Memorial Chapel. Just as we emerged from lockdowns, so it was a very emotional time um, through the support of the dear Green Boppy. And in May this year, it was also really wonderful to have the opportunity to work with Unity Sisters in Glasgow and um, to organize art workshops for women from asylum seeking and refugee communities in the city. And for the workshop, I had the support of Nadin Swear who many of you will know is an incredible textile designer and part of the UNESCO Riley team. We taught the women how to paint their self-portraits, sewing vibrant African fabric onto their, as elaborate headdresses onto their designs for the finishing touch. And we all had a lot of fun. And what was amazing to see was the women's growth in confidence and assurance as they created these works of art, astonished by their own ability and creativity. So the inspiration for this workshop came from the workshops that I had previously organized in Iraqi Kurdistan and Northern Nigeria for survivors of forced displacement and conflict related sexual violence. And for many, it had been the first time that they had ever drawn or painted before. But the hope was that the art workshops would create a safe space for the women to share their stories. Telling our stories helps individuals to integrate traumatic memories and gradually begin to heal and reclaim their dignity. But language is often inadequate to convey the experiences of trauma in conflict. However, the arts can help to unlock this process and give a new form of communication to address the silence and unspeakable pain. So like the Yazidi women and the Nigerian women also chose to paint glistening tears of gold. And um, as you can see in this painting by Aisha. This inspired the title of my exhibition, so the purpose of these projects was both therapeutic and for advocacy. It was to empower the women's stories to be heard through their self-portraits and also in my portrait paintings of them. Um, here is a series of the Yazidi Rohingya and Nigerian women. Um, so these, so the paintings, these paintings are due to be exhibited at the International Peace Institute in New York this September, and they were displayed last week at the UK government's ministerial on, on freedom of religion and belief, and also the Preventional Sexual Violence Initiative Conference um, due to take place in November. For many survivors of unspeakable violence, experience a profound sense of powerlessness, an overwhelming and deeply rooted feeling that they do not have a voice. Thus, one of the primary needs of survivors again is to feel like a person again, to rediscover their own sense of personhood and voice. And this is what I hope that these art projects and the exhibitions um, in a small way will help to do. John Paul Lederach writes, art and finding our way back to humanity are connected. So um, I'm aware that what I've been involved in thus far is just a glimpse of the potential healing and restorative power of the arts as a catalyst for change. And it's my hope to develop a deeper theoretical understanding of the transformative and restorative power of the arts with regard to promoting human rights, dialogue, peace building and healing. Um, and in particular, 
to understand um, initiatives that harness arts-based methods in post-conflict and migratory settings. So my PhD studentship with UNESCO Ryla at the University of Glasgow is an amazing opportunity to grow in understanding in regard to this and to have the opportunity to learn from other artivists and practitioners who are working in this field. Um, so it is to be continued. And thank yes, so thank you for letting me present to you today this work. And I'm sorry I couldn't be in person with you in person. And um, I look forward to meeting soon. Thank you.